Uh, it is a pleasure to be with you this morning, and uh, it's also an honor to bring what is, I would say, a vision from Scripture, from the Lord, from the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the Lord speaks through his prophets uh, in the Old Testament, and we're looking at the prophet Isaiah. If there's anyone here this morning that needs a little a vision beyond uh, what, what you're daily experiencing, the struggles, the strife, the, the conflicts that you see around you, uh, if there's anyone who needs it, I certainly do. And so this is a wonderful reminder uh, and encouragement to us as we uh, open up God's Word to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. And uh, I'll just read it here. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we come to you from uh, all kinds of backgrounds and experiences, uh, even uh, coming this morning. Uh, we, uh, some of us have experienced conflict and strife, uh, maybe external, maybe even internal. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're a God who meets us exactly wherever we are. Uh, that you're a God that, that meets us wherever we are on our spiritual journey with you. Whether we're dipping our toes in the water of Christianity, maybe for the very first time, uh, maybe we've been dragged here, uh, or maybe we've been walking with you for a very long time with us. We thank you that you're, you are so gracious, uh, that you're not uh, heavy-handed or uh, beating us down, but you are gracious to meet us exactly where we are. And so, Lord Jesus, I ask that as we come this morning, as we, we, we have this word before us, that you would meet each and every one of us wherever we are uh, with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 2014, actor and comedian Jerry Seinfeld won a Clio Award. Anybody know what a Clio Award is? Anybody follow the Clio Awards? I mean, active followers? It's actually, Clio Awards are basically Oscars for commercials. Uh, it's kind of funny. That, that, that doesn't really matter much. But actually what Jerry Seinfeld said in his acceptance speech is what's more interesting to me. Uh, here he is he accepting this great award for his uh, performances, performances, uh, in quotes, in the American Express commercials. You remember those old ones. He's accepting this award, and he gets up behind the podium. Thank you for this award. And these are the words that he says. I love advertising because I love lying. In advertising, everything is the way you wish it was. I don't care that it won't be like that when I actually get the product being advertised because in between seeing the commercial and owning the thing, I'm happy, and that's all I want. Tell me how great the thing is going to be. I love it. I don't need to be happy all the time. I just want to enjoy the commercial. I want to get the thing. We know the product is going to stink. We know that. Because we live in the world, and we know that everything stinks. We all believe, hey, maybe this one won't stink. We are a hopeful species. Stupid, but hopeful. Profound words. 
I love, I love advertising because I love lying. Because we know that everything in the world stinks. But we hope maybe, maybe this one won't stink. You know, Seinfeld is, is so on here. Because he captures two tensions that we all feel. And that is, we live in a broken world. Not just the products. We, you know, it's not just they don't make things the way they used to. But it's relationships. It's marriages. It's families. It's relationships with our children. Uh, clients. Bosses. Uh, this world is broken. Uh, I had a friend, mentor of mine, who... His son died uh, just a couple months ago, age 33, from, from a rare form of cancer. Just, he died. The day after his funeral, funeral, his niece, who attended the funeral, by the way, died of stage four colon cancer. This world is broken. Things are not the way that they're supposed to be. And maybe you're experiencing stresses and hardship in your life and conflict right now in your life. Shootings. Racism. This, way, this world is not the way it's supposed to be. It stinks. It's broken. If you're here this morning, you're struggling with the brokenness in your life and the world, I want you to say, I want you to hear this this morning. It's okay. Because it does stink. This world is not the way it's supposed to be. It's broken. But then there's the other side that this vision from the prophet Isaiah gives to us. And that is, there is hope. Why is it that every one of us long for something greater? Because God has put that longing and that hope in every one of our hearts for something that may, hey, maybe this one may not stink. Maybe this relationship, this job, this house, whatever it is, won't stink. But God wants to give you something greater than those things. He wants to give you himself. And so we read in the, the prophet Isaiah here, the context is God's people are, they have been, they're in exile, and things aren't the way that they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be in the land flowing of milk and honey, the promised land. But the world stinks. They're, they're in exile. They're not in their homeland. They're enslaved. And the Lord comes to them to, to, to Judah. He comes to, concerning Jerusalem and Judah and says, I've got a word of hope. Here's a vision for you. The mountain and the, of the house of the Lord is going to be lifted up. The mountain and the house of the Lord is going to be lifted up. And three things are going to happen. Here are these three things when the house of the Lord is going to be lifted up. The Lord will be exalted above all gods. The nations will come, and the Lord will bring everlasting peace. Where do we see that in this passage this morning? Let's unpack those three things. The Lord will be exalted above all gods. In verse 2, Isaiah says, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. Now, I, I did some geographical research, uh, topographical, uh, if you will, the, the, the terminology, uh, the mountains and elevations both in, in the Bible uh, and, and outside and, of course, in the world. And a couple things struck me. The mountain of the house of the Lord is supposed to be the highest of all mountains. Of course, the mountain of, that he's speaking about in Mount Zion in Jerusalem were the temple of the Lord. That's the house of the Lord. The temple of the Lord is to be exalted above all the other mountains. And yet, in my research, this is what I found. Here, uh, mountains in the Bible. Mount Zion is 2,529 feet above sea level, a modest uh, little mountain, more like a hill, kind of like uh, the Poconos when we ski, right? Mount Hermon, 9,232 feet. Mount Gerizim is 2,890 feet above sea level. And the Mount of Olives is 2,682. Those mountains tower 
above Mount Zion, this physical mountain. If you go uh, beyond, in, in the Middle East, the highest mountain is Mount Damavdad, I can't pronounce it, in Iran, is 18,400 feet above sea level. And then, of course, the largest mountain in the world is Mount Everest, 29,029 feet. So was the Lord lying when he was saying the mountain of the house of the Lord is going to be the highest of mountains? Or maybe it was just the world at that time, they didn't know how tall mountains were going to get. They just weren't as educated. They didn't have the kinds of science. It's one of the critiques we hear of, of the Bible. You know, their, their science is not you know, as advanced. As, you know, if they knew what we knew, well, well, they wouldn't believe the things that they believe. But actually, that's not true. Isaiah is hinting at something far greater. The Lord is hinting at something greater than a physical mountain. Of course, in Jerusalem, that's where God's people met. And they, and they climbed the mountains to meet with their Lord. They ascended into Mount Zion to the temple in Jerusalem to worship the Lord. But there's something greater, something far more than just a physical mountain or even a physical house. that where God's people would go and they would worship God. You know, God's people would, whether you're part of, of course, ancient Israel or people who worship other gods, where they would meet with their God, they would go to the mountains. That's where you would go to worship your God. You would meet him in the mountains. Now, the word worship is kind of an older churchy word. Maybe we thought we gather for worship on Sunday morning. We can tend to think of worship as the, the one thing uh, that we gather with a certain group of people on a Sunday morning somewhere. But the idea of worship is much broader than just, just an assembly. It has to do with the word service. What do you serve? And when you expand the definition of worship to be beyond just a gathering, singing songs, hearing a sermon, taking part in the sacraments, to expand to service, then you've got something that expands the whole of your life. That uh, what do you give your money to? What do you give your thoughts to? What do you daydream about? What are your, if only I had blank, I would be happy. What do you uh, dedicate your life to? What do you serve? That is worship. There's a brilliant scholar, uh, a man named David Foster Wallace, um, who delivered what was a commencement college address in 2005. It's called the Kenyon College Address. And here he's talking to college graduates, addressing them, and he says these words of encouragement to these college graduates. There's no such thing as atheism. There's no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel it is enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you in the ground. Really encouraging words. Thank you, David. Worship power. You will end up feeling weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart, you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. You see, Foster Wallace captures 
brilliantly for us that tension that we all worship. That maybe this, this idea of going to the mountains or going to a temple maybe seem distant to us. But when we think about our lives, our beauty, our intellect, our power, money, material things, comfort, pleasure, you can fill in the blank. When we base our lives on those things, while it says when you worship those things, they will end up enslaving you. They will eat you alive. And in fact, three years after Foster Wallace gave this address, he committed suicide. Something did eat him alive. Is that you this morning? Is, is there something that's got you other than God? That you've maybe something good that God has given you? Your marriage, your family, your job, your education. What is it that you, God has given you and you have elevated that above God? You, you serve that and you are a slave to that. And that is consuming you and that is eating you alive this morning. I would submit to you that is worship. And in this passage, Isaiah gives us something better, something even more freeing. You see, the mountain in the house of the Lord that's being lifted up is not a mountain. It's not a physical structure. It's, it's not a building. It's not a temple. But this, this prophecy is foreshadowing, looking ahead to someone, to a person who would be lifted up. Who would be lifted up above all gods. And he would be exalted. And how will we be lifted up? The Lord Jesus said it this way in John chapter 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may, be, may have eternal life. What does he mean to be lifted up? The Son of God came down, plunged himself in this sin-soaked, stained world that he would be lifted up on the cross. The highest of all the, the God's glory would be manifested on Jesus pouring out his life and God pouring out his wrath on him for your sin and mine that we might be welcomed in, that we would become true worshipers, worshipers of the one and only true God through this Jesus. Think about the uniqueness of Christianity. Metaphorically speaking, in all other religions, people are climbing mountains to meet with their God. That's where you met with your deity in the, in the ancient times. You went into the mountains to meet with God. And even true, God's people did the same too. Uh, in, uh, we see in the Psalms, Psalms 120 to 134, they're called the Psalms of Ascent. And God's people make this journey up to Jerusalem, to the temple, in order to worship their God. But all the religions do the same thing. And they made their pilgrimages. And they, metaphorically, they were working their way to God, to meet with their God by their performance. Do you struggle with that? Do you try to earn God's love and acceptance by what you do, by your actions, by, by being the best parent, by, by saying, I'm going to be uh, the best uh, client or the best uh, business person, whatever it is, or the best student, like you, that somehow your worth before God is measured by your performance. That is climbing the mountain. That is trying to earn your way to the top of the mountain in order to meet with God by your performance. And notice what Isaiah is saying. This God comes down. He comes down in order to bring you up to him. Through his life, death, and resurrection, he comes down to you to meet you and me where, we, where you are and makes you right before him, not by your performance, not by your works, but through Jesus' perfect life, death, 
and resurrection. Jesus living the life that you and I should have lived, dying the death that you and I should have died, and rose again. You know, one of my favorite comedians is Jim Gaffigan. And Jim Gaffigan has a part in his, his stand-up routine where he talks about a time when John Paul II came and met the guy in prison who tried to kill him. Tried to shoot him. He's like, isn't that funny? Like he, Pope John Paul, he like literally went to the prison and said, I forgive you to the guy. And then I love what Gaffigan says. He said, but he didn't take him home. He didn't, like, invite him back to his house, like, hey, I forgive you, come back home, be part of my family. But that is exactly what God did for you and for me. He not only pardons us, forgives us of our sins, but he says, guess what? You can be a part of my family. You are welcome into my family. You're not an alien. You're not an orphan. You're not an outsider. You are a son and daughter of mine. Come. Come be with me. The Lord will be exalted above all gods. But secondly, he will bring the nations to himself. The nations will come. We see this, that the nations will come and they will gather and they will say, let us go, let us go and and ask the Lord to teach us his ways and teach us his laws. The nations are coming. The nations will come and they are coming. Going back to the early part of the beginning of the book of Acts, where God's people are are huddled together, and they're, they're fearful, and the Spirit of God comes, and Peter stands up and gives this awesome sermon. I don't know what the sermon was, but people, people are hearing the good news of Jesus in their language, and 3,000 people, what an awesome sermon that must have been, like, or, or experience. 3,000 people right there and then come to Christ, come to follow Jesus. But it doesn't stop there because God's people say, hey, this is great. Let's have like an awesome place, a little church to ourselves. This is pretty big. I mean, 3,000 people is a pretty big church. God's like, no, my heart is for the nations. And he sends persecution. And so God's people leave Jerusalem and they go out and they spread spread the good news of Jesus beyond Jerusalem and to Samaria and Judea and to the ends of the earth. So much so that even in our day, we see the nations are coming. People are coming to follow this Jesus. There was a a news report uh, that revealed, talking about people thinking like, Christianity is on decline, and the article is a Washington Post article said, no, actually it's not in decline. It may be declining in the states, but it's growing rapidly in Latin America and Africa and, and other places around the world. The center of Christianity is no longer in Western, in the Western Europe, but it's in the global south. People are coming to him. Look at some t- statistics I want to encourage you with this morning. Globally, every day, approximately 40,000 people come to faith in Christ. Every week, an average of 3,500 new churches open around the world. People from this organization called the Joshua Project, like, how are they going like, hey, there's a conversion. Like, how are they, they tabulate these totals, all right? They do all the math and produce these statistics. In 1950, when China banned missionaries, there were 1 million believers. Today, there is an estimated 75 million believers and 10,000 new Christians in China every day. There are more followers of Jesus Christ in China than in North America. And then in terms of translating the Bible, today at least some portions of the Bible are translated in 2,883 languages of the 6,877 known languages of the earth. The nations are coming. People are hearing the good news of Jesus, and they're following. They're coming. This, this Lord is being lifted up and exalted, and nations are coming. But look at the diversity. When you think of the compare Christianity with all the other religions of the world, we talk about what is the diversity of Christianity. Notice now, 90% of the world's Muslims live in one part of the world, namely the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. 88% of Buddhists live in East Asia. 98% of Hindus live in India. Just think about that. 
People say, if I grew up in those parts of the world, I would be, this is what I would believe. But notice this, world Christianity. 25% of the world's Christians live in Europe. 25% of the world's Christians live in Central and South America. 22% of the world's Christians live in Africa. 15% of the world's Christians live in Asia. And 12 to 15% of the world's Christians live in North America. Now, what are those? What does that mean? There was a scholar, uh, Anglican scholar named Richard Bauckham, and he said this: Almost certainly, Christianity exhibits more cultural diversity than any other religion, and that must say something about it. What is Bauckham talking about? He's talking about a, a diversity and inclusion that you don't see in any other major religions of the world. You know, one of the, the beefs or people that struggle with Christianity is they say that Christianity is so exclusive, it's, too, it's intolerant, it's oppressive. I can't follow a religion that is exclusive and, and, and intolerant as Christianity. Uh, my neighbor was talking, and she said, um, you know, I love those bumper stickers. There's bumper stickers that say coexist, right? She's, she's favorite. It's like, let's just be tolerant. Let's, let's be welcoming. You know what? I get her. I get what she's saying. There's, there's something to that. But think about this. Let this phrase fit, sink in your mind for a moment. Christianity is the most exclusive, inclusive religion. Christianity is the most exclusive, inclusive religion. It's exclusive, and it says... The words of Jesus in John 14. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the only way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So the only way to come to God, Jesus says, is through me. Through my life, death, and resurrection. What he's hinting at. But at the same time, Christianity is the most inclusive in the sense that no one deserves God's love and acceptance and favor. No one. Regardless of race, socioeconomic background, political party, whatever it is, religious performance, no one deserves God's love and acceptance. And yet, here's how the inclu- what's the inclusive part? Jesus... The, 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 the playing field is level. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. That when you receive Christ, you're included. And people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, nationality, all kinds of backgrounds are coming, are included. The most culturally diverse Christianity. And that is unique. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful that that you and I are a part of something that is much greater and more inclusive. Notice the impact on early Christianity. Early Christianity, this inclusiveness across racial barriers. Back then, Jews, Greeks, Gentiles, right, despised each other. But suddenly, this 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 Jesus comes along. And the Apostle Paul can say that the walls of hostility have been broken down. Do we want the solution to racism in the world? Racial reconciliation through Christ, through the good news of Jesus that says no race is more superior than any other. We are all a lot worse than we can ever dare to imagine but we are also more loved than we would ever dared to hope. We're included. The treatment of women, the early, early Christianity, women were, they were second-class citizens. They were despised. Their testimony wasn't admissible in court. And what do you have in the Gospels? Look in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus encountering and dignifying women and then what do you have? Okay, their, their testimony is not admissible in court, so what's the first thing you do? 
to bring witnesses to the resurrection? You put women. Women are the witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. That's not by accident. It's not a good PR move, Jesus. I mean, come on, you know, I mean, these people's your testimony are already admissible. No, because Christianity dignifies them and gives them honor and makes them co-heirs with Christ, that they're not inferior. Um, more examples, the treatment of orphans and unwanted, unwanted children. Think about this. In Roman, if you were a, a father and you had a daughter and you didn't want it, you just throw her into the to the river. Just, you could kill her. That was something you could do. Christianity comes along and says, no. You come be with us. You are adopted. You are, you are a child of God. You are beautiful in your mother's womb. God saw you and knit you together. And he beautifully and fearfully and wonderfully made. You belong to God's people. You belong to God. And we have this wonderful image of this adoption, being adopted as we are orphans, as it were, alienated by God, by our sin. Now we are adopted into Christ, says the Apostle Paul. And now also indentured servants. I mean, back then, people struggled with the idea, modern people struggle with the idea of slavery, uh, rightfully so, when it comes in the forms that we saw in early uh, 19th century, and, and even still it goes on in human trafficking today. But this was, in Scripture, indentured servitude. People were, they were less. They were still less second-class citizens. And what does the, the Apostle Paul say in Galatians 3? He says, Galatians 3.28, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. You're all one in Christ Jesus. Everybody Rich, poor, black, white, Asian, whatever the race that you come, all one in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? This is what we are part of. This is what God is doing. when Christ is lifted up as the highest that, that the nations will be drawn to him. And then finally, God would bring through him an everlasting peace. In verses 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5, let me read that for us again. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Look at this image. Weapons, swords, Swords will be beaten into plowshares, right? And spears into pruning hooks. What was once used for war, weapons of war, are now used as weapons, not as weapons, but actually as tools for farming. And what Isaiah is picturing for us is that there's going to be everlasting peace. That the, you won't need to learn war. You won't, nation will not need to be training armies anymore. We won't have to make weapons anymore. We won't have to be in an ever-expanding arms race. But nation will not turn against nation anymore. And you're saying maybe to yourself, like, where I sit, <laughs> I don't see the absence of conflict I don't see peace around the world. I don't see the ending of the shooting violence around at schools and other places. And, and I certainly don't feel the end of conflict even within myself or the people around me. So what is Isaiah saying to us? Is this just something like, oh, oh a hope, you know, just down the road, hope, hope it all works out in the end? If I can say it this way, there is a already component to this and there is a not yet component to this. The already component, the, the guarantee of peace, everlasting peace, is that God first and foremost makes peace with us through his son, Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, since we have been justified, since we have been made right with God, therefore we have peace. We have peace with God. God is not angry at us because of our sin, 
He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't judge us. Christ didn't die for your best days. He died for your worst. If I can illustrate it for a moment, uh, I don't know if there are any people who play golf in the room, any golfers. Um, I don't play because I'm a terrible golfer, but occasionally I'll get invited by some friends to play a charity tournament. And I'll, you know, you go out in a group of four guys, and it's called a best ball tournament. You know, in golf, you're, you're just trying to hit the ball in the little hole in the least amount of strokes. And I, and I go out with a group of these four guys, and uh, we try to, you play whatever the best ball is. So if the ball, if you hit yours in the trees, and the next guy hits it like straight on the fairway, closer to the hole, you play, that, play from that ball, and everybody hits from there. And on and on and on until you get the ball in the hole. So once the last time I went out, which was like over a year or two ago, to play with four guys, a charity tournament, my friend introduced me to, to two guys, and he said, and this guy is a professional golfer. We're going to win this thing because we got a pro golfer. And so what happens, I get up and I hit the ball into the trees. The next guy comes up, he hits the ball into the water. The next guy hits the ball, my friend hits it in the sand trap, and then a pro golfer just hits it straight down the fairway towards the hole. We're playing that ball. And so his ball, his perfect shot, cancels all of our bad shots, and we get his score. You see what has happened there. That's exactly what God has done for us, has done for you in Christ Jesus. Jesus has canceled your debt of your sin, but not only cancels your debt, but gives you Jesus' perfect life in your, your place. Jesus lives a life that you and I should have died and dies the death that you and I should have died so that we might rise again and we, we might be right with him so that you and I could have peace with God. And that peace we can have even in the midst of conflict and chaos and wars all around us. We can have that peace that, to know that I am right with God, that, that I don't have to do anything to earn God's love and acceptance because God's love and acceptance is already upon me. And even though I, I can lose a job, uh, I can have conflict and turmoil with, even within my family, uh, I can see the chaos that's happening all around me in the world, and I can still have peace. And that peace guarantees the not yet, the final peace, the everlasting peace where there will be no war, there will be no weapons, but there will be only tools of peace in our lives. When will that be? We don't exactly know. We don't know when the Lord will return and bring that in. But we, we, we know that it's guaranteed. He did already everything that we ever needed through the cross. And so let me close with these words often used in, in, in many sermons that I joke about. But uh, J.R. Tolkien's story, The Lord of the Rings, you know, the whole story about the Lord of the Rings is that you know the dwarves... Uh, Elves and hobbits get together and they have to destroy this evil ring. The ring. The, what Gollum says, the precious is the precious. Got to get rid of the precious, right? And they destroy it. And at the end of the, the, the final uh, the trilogy, The Return of the King, one of the hobbits is having this conversation J.R. Tolkien has uh, with Gandalf, the great white wizard. And, and, and Samwise Gamshi says, I, I, I thought you were dead, Gandalf. And I, and I thought I was dead too. But you're alive. And, and the, Tolkien has these final words, these powerful words. Samwise Gamshi says, does this mean that everything sad is going to come untrue? And that is the hope for us. The scholar C.S. Lewis talks about, this is what our God, and these are the final words. Our God does this. 
He can untie things that are now knotted together and tie up things that are still dangling loose. That is to come. You see, Seinfeld was right. Seinfeld was right that this world is broken and everything in this world stinks. And yet we are, we are hopeful. Maybe call us foolish for having the hope that we have in Christ Jesus that everything sad will come untrue and that he will tie up things that are not, untie things that are knotted and knot up things that are, need to be tied together. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you.